offering our obeisances. Namo Vishnu Brahma Krishna Prasthaya Buddha Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tanamane Namaste Sarasatun Deve Gauravani Pacharane Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Aspradhyade Sitarane So we're reading from the Bhagavad Gita as it is chapter 14, the three modes of material nature, text number 26. Mamchayo Vyabicharina, Bhakti Yogena Sevate, Sagunan Samati Dhyaitan, Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. Translation purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. One who engages in full devotional service and failing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. To Prabhupada's purport, this verse is a reply to Arjuna's third question. What is the means of obtaining to the transcendental position? As explained before, the material world is acting under the spell of the modes of material nature. One should not be disturbed by the activities of the modes of nature. Instead of putting his consciousness into such activities, he may transfer his consciousness to Krishna, con Krishna activities. Krishna activities are known as bhakti yoga, always acting for Krishna. This includes not only Krishna, but his different planetary expansions such as Rama and Narayan. He has innumerable expansions. One who is engaged in the service of any of the forms of Krishna or of his plenary expansions is considered to be transcendentally situated. One should also note that all the forms of Krishna are fully transcendental, blissful, and full of knowledge and eternal. Such personalities of Godhead are omnipotent and omniscient, and they possess all transcendental qualities. So, if one engages himself in the service of Krishna or his plenary expansions with unfailing determination, although these modes of material nature are very difficult to overcome, one can overcome them easily. This has already been explained in the seventh chapter. One who surrenders unto Krishna at once surmounts the influence of the modes of material nature. To be in Krishna consciousness or in devotional service means to acquire equality with Krishna. The Lord says that his nature is eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. And the living entity is a part and parcel of the Supreme. As gold particles are part of a gold mine, thus the living entity in his spiritual position is as good as gold, as good as Christian quality. The difference of individuality continues. Otherwise, there would be no question of bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga means that the Lord is there and the devotee is there and the activity of exchange of love between the Lord and the devotee is there. Therefore, the individuality of two persons is present. In the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the individual person. Otherwise, there would be no meaning to Bhakti Yoga. If one is not situated in the same transcendental position with the Lord, one cannot serve the Supreme Lord. To be a personal assistant to a king, one must acquire, acquire, acquire the qualifications. Thus the qualification is to become Brahman, or freed from all material contamination. It is said in the Vedic literature, Brahmaiva san Brahmaityate, one could attain the Supreme Brahman by becoming Brahman. This means that one must qualitatively become one with Brahman. By taming the Brahman, one does not lose his eternal Brahman identity as an individual soul. 
So the verse again. Mam jayo yavicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samiti dhyayatan brahma bhuyaya kalpate one who engages in full devotional service and failing in all circumstances at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. This verse, as many other verses, probably all the verses, they explain basically the same concepts. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is trying to elevate Arjuna's consciousness to a higher level of perception and conception. And he does this by repeating the same philosophy in each chapter of the Bhagavad Gita from different points of view. Basically, the points of view are karma yoga, jnana yoga, Astanga Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. Karma Yoga means that Krishna is trying to convince the conditioned soul that everything belongs to Krishna. He does that by explaining <laughs> supremacy over the material nature. If we want to claim that something belongs to us, then we must have control over whatever we claim belongs to us. But even our body, which we imagine belongs to us, but how much control do we have over the body? For instance, Harani Kashipu underwent great austerity for 120 years of the demigods. He underwent an austerity that we cannot even begin to imagine we could do even to the smallest degree. For instance, he stood on the tip of his toes for 120 years of the demigods, which is many times our years. Now, most of us, if we stood on our toes for five minutes, we'd fall over. And what to speak of with our arms out, right, out extended. And if we did it for one day, we'd get very hungry. And we'd call someone to bring us prasadam and we wouldn't be able to hold our hands out like that so it, or someone would have to put the prasadam in our mouth but it's very unlikely we'd be able to hold such a posture for more than five or ten minutes and yet he did it for 120 years of the demigods with the idea that he wanted to become immortal of course he understood he was a spiritual being, but because he was in the Bali concept of life, and because he wanted to control the universe, he thought that if I can stand like this for 120 years of the demigods, then I might get some benediction from Brahma, where he would allow me to be immortal. And from there, I could conquer the other demi, the, the demigods, and therefore control the universe. Even the ants came, the moths came, and they ate his flesh, they ate his muscles, they ate his fat, they even ate his brains. Because after all, if he had any brains, he wouldn't keep on standing like that. Now, ultimately, because of the disturbance he caused to the universe, Lord Brahma came to give him benedictions. But Lord Brahma told him when Haranyakashipu asked to become immortal, that I myself am not immortal. So how can I give you something I can't give myself? 
And although Arundhati Kashipu asked for a hundred other benedictions, all with the idea that he would not be killed in, in the day or at night, inside or outside by any animal, man or beast. So in spite of a hundred benedictions, still eventually he developed some acute stomach problem and died. So his great austerity could not save him from death. And what to speak of ourselves? Can we stop even one atom in our body from changing? And if we can't, then how can we claim to be the controller of our body? Now we may stand on one finger. We may be able to jump over a big, you know, as high as a, whatever we can jump, seven, three meters or whatever we can jump. Still, we may come down dead. We may stand on, the, on our finger and leave our body doing it. So what do we gain by standing on our finger or jumping three meters into the air? We haven't solved any of our real problems. Therefore, karma yoga is an attempt to do our activities under a authority without being attached to the result. Recognizing at least that Krishna is the controller and therefore we're obliged to at least do our activities without attachment to the result. Now, one who performs karma yoga, he may or may not understand his relationship with Krishna or even Vishnu. He may not know who Vishnu is, although he may recognize Vishnu as the proprietor. And by such dutiful activity, one becomes gradually free from the material concept of life. As Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, uh, Brahma, Bhuta, Prasanatma, Nishoshiti, Akankshiti, Samak Sarveshu Bhuteshu, Madhvatim Lavate Param. That when one comes to the Brahma Bhuta platform, one becomes Prasanatma, fully joyful. Prabhupada says it's not exactly joyfulness, it's a lack of suffering. It's like one is in prison for many, many years, and then finally the day comes, one is free from the prison, and one feels joyful. Now, we ourselves presently are not in a prison, but just by the fact that we're not in a prison doesn't make us joyful. But there's a joyfulness when one becomes free from the material concept of life, and is no longer suffering through one's material existence. So that's called prasanatma. It's not exactly fully joyful, but it's lack of suffering, which makes one, in one sense, joyful. And what is the suffering caused by? Soshiti and kangshiti. This is the materialistic existence or material existence we have two businesses in the material world. We hanker for what we don't have, and we lament over what we lost, or some combination. For instance, we may be hankering for something, and when we get it, even if we don't lose it, we, we lament the fact that we got it. That happens a lot in marriage sometimes. One is hankering to get married to a certain person, and then after they get married, they lament. Or they don't, they, uh, don't get married, and then they lament. Probably said there's some, there's some 
ladu that if you it's supposed to be so tasty that if you don't get it you lament that you don't have it and if you get it and you eat it eventually you lose it so you lament also so someone is hankering for it and unhappy because they don't have it someone else gets it and then loses it and then laments in any case we have two businesses hankering and lamentation actually what we should be hankering for is to become Krishna conscious and what we should be lamenting over is the fact that we're not Krishna conscious hankering and lamentation are eternal nature of the soul it's a question of what we're hankering for and what we're lamenting over we're hankering for Krishna then we become blissful and if we lament the fact that we don't have him then we also become blissful and if Krishna is not in the equation then we become disturbed we suffer we instead of identifying ourselves as Krishna's servant we're forced to identify ourselves as Maya's servant. Now, as it says in the previous verses to this verse, Arjuna had asked three questions. The first question was, what are the symptoms of a self-realized person? The second question was, what is his behavior? And the third question was, how does one come to transcend the material modes of nature? So in answer to the first question, Krishna says that the soul is neutral. A self-realized person is neutral to material nature. Prakasham cha, uh, prakasham cha, nivritim cha, moham eva chapandava. One who does not hate illumination, attachment, or delusion when they're present, who longs for them when they're absent, remains neutral, knowing that the modes of nature alone are active and that he is aloof from them. One who looks upon a pebble, stone, and gold is the same. So this is a neutrality that Krishna has explained in many parts of the Bhagavad Gita. As a matter of fact, in practically every chapter, Krishna talks about this neutrality. Not to become elated when we get what we want or disturbed when we get what we don't want. Because after all, the body is not this ourselves. Whatever we gain externally, doesn't really affect ourselves as a spiritual being. And whatever we lose, including our body, doesn't affect us either. But it's due to our attachment to the material body that we suffer. We suffer either when we get what we want, or we lament when we lose what we, what we didn't want to lose. So it's due to our bodily identification that we think that we need something or lament when we lose something. But this is all in relation to the body. Actually, what we need is Krishna, Krishna consciousness, and we should feel, lament, uh, we should lament when we don't have it. Therefore, Krishna says, Naprari Shat Priyam Prapyam. Oh, actually, the second thing is that Krishna says, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Nishoshiti Nakanshiti. Hankering and lamentation lead to different abnormal relationships with other living entities. If we're hankering for something in the material world, then we'll see those living entities who can give us what we want as our friends. That is not only grossly, but it's also subtly. If so, if I'm 
I have all my material needs met. Still, I may be hankering for profit, adoration, and distinction. Someone who has even billions of dollars sometimes is hankering for more money. And he sees those people who help him get that more money as his friends. When Howard Hughes was the richest man in the world, he had $16 billion around 1970, which is probably equal to $160 billion now. When he was asked, now that you have so much money, what would you like? And his answer was, I want more money. Now, obviously, he had no idea of God consciousness. As a matter of fact, when Shul Prabhupada was on a morning walk in Dallas, Texas, where I used to live myself, and I used to go to that park on walks also. And in that park, it's called White Rock Lake Park. And on the other side of the lake, there is one mansion. And Howard Hughes lived there. So one day, the devotees from Dallas went there and tried to distribute a Bhagavad Gita to Howard Hughes. Of course, the guards at the gate did not allow the devotees to go in and try to distribute the Bhagavad Gita to Howard Hughes. But they said they'd give it to him. They told Prabhupada that, and Prabhupada asked the devotees, what would you have told Howard Hughes if you had had the opportunity to meet him? So one devotee said, I would have said, my dear Howard Hughes, you're such a nice man, and we have such a nice school. We're educating children. So maybe you should give us a donation to help our school. Another devotee said, I would say, my dear Howard Hughes, please chant Hare Krishna and be happy. But Prabhupada, he said, no, if I would have seen Howard Hughes, I would have said, my dear Howard Hughes, you've made so much money from oil, but actually that oil belongs to Krishna, and therefore you're a thief. You've stolen that money, that oil from Krishna. Therefore, one day, Krishna, the agents of Krishna will come and drag you away to chastise you. The devotees were quite surprised at Prabhupada's very strong preaching. But later on, Prabhupada showed that, that preaching on a morning walk in Mayapur on the roof of the, what's called the Long Building. Who probably was walking on his morning walk at that time in the 70s. And he was followed by many of his disciples and life members who were accompanying him. And one of the devotees introduced one of the life members who was dressed in Kadi. Kadi means the dress that Gandhi, Gandhi was made popular, white linen cloth. And he introduced Mr. Patel as a big industrialist. So Prabhupada greeted him and said, Hare Krishna, nice to meet you. I hear you're an industrialist. What industry are you? do you own? So the man said, I own the glass industry. And Prabhupada said, oh, how nice. And where does glass come from? So the man smiling said, it comes from sand. And Shula Prabhupada asked the man, so where does sand come from? And the man still smiling said, it comes from Bhagavan. 
because he was a little pious. He understood that. So Prabhupada smiled at him and said, so you're stealing from Bhagavan. So the man was a little embarrassed. He disappeared for the rest of the morning walk. But at the very end of the walk, he came up very enthusiastically to Shri Prabhupada and said, Swamiji, I just want to tell you that I give in charity. So Prabhupada smiled at the man and said, so you're a little thief. And everyone, including the man, began to laugh. So there's a saying in Bengal, whether you steal a cucumber or a diamond, you're still a thief. Kora and Kora. Kora, I forget one of them means diamond, and Kora means a thief. Similarly, in the material world, everyone is claiming proprietorship over Krishna's energy. And the worst thing is that people are not satisfied with what Krishna is giving them. They want to steal more from Krishna. Just like the Pandavas were always put into difficulty. As a matter of fact, Bhishma Dev, when he remembered the difficulties that the Pandavas were put into, although he was in a very uncomfortable situation, he was uh, lying on a bed of arrows, not just lying on a bed of arrows, he had arrows shot throughout his entire body and the arrow points were sticking into the ground and were serving as a place that was elevating him off the ground. Now, inconceivably difficult position. If we have a thumbtack in our foot, we're crying, calling 911 for help. The ambulance must come for the thumbtack in our foot. And yet Bhishma Dev had arrows shot through his entire body. And yet when he remembered the difficulties the Pandavas went through, he began to cry. Vishan Mahagne Purushara Darshanat Asad Asabaya Banavana Krishata Mride Mride Neka Maharatastra So Pranyastra Masma Charnam Virakshitaha. The Bhima was fed poison. They tried to kill him in so many different ways. They were put into a house of lack and was set on fire. They tried to disrobe the Kauravas, tried to disrobe Draupadi. In so many different ways, they tried to kill the Pandavas, or Kauravas tried to kill the Pandavas, including on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. They were throwing atomic weapons at them. They even burned Priksha Maharaj, the ashes. Abhimanyu, not Abhimanyu, uh, Duryodhana's son, uh, Duryodhana's, not Duryodhana, Dronacharya's son threw a Brahmastra weapon to kill Priksha Maharaj in the womb. And yet, when Kunti Devi was thinking about all the difficulties that she had experienced, she was praying for more difficulty. Why? Because she said that whenever we have difficulty, we naturally remember you. And by remembering you, then we're actually coming to the spiritual platform in which we'll never, no longer see birth and death anymore. So that's very good. She's praying for difficulty so she can remember Krishna. And we're in Kali Yuga, but well, we don't have to pray for difficulty. 
Kali Yuga means one difficulty after another, even without our prayers. But generally, people don't pray for difficulty. What they pray for is, she says, Janmaishvarya Shruta Shibir, Edaman Kumakuman, Naivahat Vavadatum Vai, Pram Akenshana Gochara. Generally, people pray for Janma. They want to take birth in a, a very rich, opulent country, or they want to get some immigrate to a place where there's wealth and good job opportunities. And above everything, they want Aishvarya. They want wealth. As Prahlad Mara said, money, money, sweeter than honey. A professional soldier, a thief, or merchant, they risk their very dear lives to get some money. Why? Because with money, you can buy honey. And with honey, you can enjoy life in some way. And people want shruta. They want material education so they can get a good job, so they can get wealth, so they can get honey and enjoy. And Sri B, somehow or another, look attractive, influence people. Even if you're 100 years old, try to look like you're 20. Put so much makeup on that one can't even see you, what you look like. You become a painting rather than a person. So this is what people are hankering for. They want material happiness and comfort. But Queen Kundi says that the problem is that we're already intoxicated by our material concept of life. We're living an existence of intoxication, being influenced by the modes of material nature. But then, if one is intoxicated and he takes more intoxication, then he becomes crazy. I know I had one friend in the days of the LSD, when people were taking LSD. He knew someone, I didn't know them, but there was something called XPT, I think it was called, whatever it is, XPT. And it was supposed to be a hundred, a thousand times more powerful than LSD. So, LSD means that the people I knew who took LSD eventually they became a little crazy. But this person who took XPT, whatever it was, I can't remember what. It, anyhow, he took it, and he never came down from the trip. He's still alive. He's still in some fantasy land somewhere. So if one is intoxicated by the material conception of life, and he adds hankering for wealth, for personal influence, for material education, then one is not only intoxicated, but one becomes completely crazy. And the problem with being crazy is that one cannot chant Hare Krishna with feeling. And if one cannot chant Hare Krishna with feeling, one has to remain in the repetition of birth and death in one of the species of life. Therefore, whether one performs karma yoga, according to the Vedic concept of life in the Varna and Ashram system, or one performs devotional service, one has to recognize oneself as not the proprietor, but as a dutiful servant. Now, in Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada writes in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Tesham sadatam yuktanam, pajantam priti purvakam, tadami buddhi yogam tam, 
yena mam upiyantite. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, then I give them the understanding by which they can come to me. So in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 10th chapter, Krishna says, I'm the Supreme Person. Everything is coming from me. And one who actually understands that I'm the source of all beauty, all wealth, all knowledge, all fame, all education, all renunciation, that such a person, when they actually become conscious of me, they naturally become attracted to me. And that attraction manifests itself in their natural feelings of love for me and affection. And therefore, those who are devotees of Krishna, they try to help others develop their love for Krishna. Because that's what Krishna wants. To be a servant of Krishna means to try to develop one's love for Krishna and help others do the same. As a matter of fact, Krishna says, anyone who helps others revive their love for me or develop their love for me, they're the most dear to me. Therefore, the devotees talk about Krishna amongst themselves so they can help each other uh, develop their love for Krishna. And, and those who are expert in service to Krishna, when they hear about Krishna, then they become ramanti, they become ecstatic hearing about Krishna. And others who are trying to come to the spiritual platform, when they hear in the right way, in such a way as to inspire them using their prana, their life energy, and their chitta, their consciousness to serve Krishna, they experience tushanti, satisfaction. They're happy that they're progressing in devotional service. They're feeling progressively greater awareness of Krishna and greater detachment from things that draw their mind away from Krishna. Now, in that verse I quoted, Tesham Sadatam Yuktanam, Prabhupada explains that even a beginning devotee practicing devotional service Obviously, they're not necessarily on the highest platform of devotional service. Still, by practicing devotional service, even though they may be acting on the platform of karma yoga, and Prabhupada defines karma yoga as that one knows that the goal is Krishna, but one is attached to the results of one's activities. Still, because the goal is Krishna, although one may want some results from one's service, still one will make progress because Krishna will purify one. The two examples of Kajendra and Dhruva Maharaj, both of them desired something from their service to Krishna. And when they got the res desired result from Krishna, because their minds were focused upon Krishna, eventually they thought that their material result was insignificant compared to their result of becoming Krishna conscious. Now, those who have risen above the idea that I'll be happy if I get my material desires fulfilled, those who are trying to get free from the material energy, like the sages of Namisharanya, or the four Kamaras, those who are Gyani Bhaktas, still Prabhupada writes that when we're in, interested in developing our spiritual knowledge, but we're also engaged in mental speculation to understand Krishna, which is a higher platform than Karma Yoga, Gyani Yoga, still, one will not understand that ultimately, or experience ultimately, that love for Krishna is the highest platform of consciousness. One will gradually understand Krishna in truth, that he's the supreme, and then develop love for him. 
what his Prabhupada writes in the Krishna book. The art of Krishna consciousness is the art of focusing one's attention and then giving one's love to Krishna. So right now we may not feel great ecstasy when we hear about Krishna all the time, or we should say, we may not feel all the time ecstasy when we hear about Krishna. Still, if we hear about Krishna and we become convinced that he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then gradually, as we become more conscious of Krishna, as we're able to focus our attention more on Krishna, then our natural love for Krishna will be awakened. As it says, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sada Kavanoi Shravanadi Shudachite Kore Udoi. That love for Krishna is natural. It's our eternal position. We're all Nitya Siddhas because inherent in our consciousness is love for Krishna. Now we're loving Krishna in many different ways. I mean, it may be not directly aware of Krishna, but we're loving Krishna's energy, which is non different from him. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Kavanoi Shravanadi. But if we hear about Krishna, then gradually our attention on Krishna will be focused. And the more we focus our attention on Krishna, then the more we'll experience the happiness of associating with Krishna, which will eventually result in our development of love for Krishna. Now, people love things that give them happiness, and Krishna is the supreme happiness. So obviously, if we become conscious of Krishna, we'll be supremely happy. That's called love for Krishna. Just like dormant in a match, is fire. And if we strike the match properly, then the fire will come out in blazing light. Similarly, if we chant Hare Krishna properly and develop the proper attitude towards Krishna, towards Krishna's devotees, towards other things in relationship to Krishna, like innocent people, even towards the non-devotees, then gradually, as we see Krishna and serve Krishna, or I should say, as we serve Krishna personally as the deities, serve Krishna in the form of his devotees, serve Krishna helping them become the innocent, become Krishna conscious, and avoiding the atheists. So our minds are not distracted from Krishna. Then gradually, our attention will be focused upon Krishna everywhere and all the time by using whatever we have in Krishna's service. Then the result is gradually our natural love for Krishna will be awakened. So Arjuna, he asked about what are the, the symptoms of a self-realized person and Krishna says there, he's a self-realized person is neutral to everyone. And his behavior is because he doesn't hanker for anything and he doesn't lament over anything. He has nothing to gain from anyone, nor is he afraid of losing anything from anyone, either grossly or subtly. He doesn't hate when someone dishonors him, or has he become overly joyful when someone honors him? He doesn't care if someone uh, doesn't give him what he wants, or if he gets something he doesn't want, he remains neutral. He's Vidya Vinaya Sampane Brahmani Gavi Hastani Shuni Chaiva Swapakecha Pandita Samadarshana. The humble sages, by virtue of true knowledge, see with an equal vision the learned and gentle Brahman, the cow, the dog, and the dog eater. Also an elephant, by the way. So this neutrality towards others, treating everyone as Krishna's servant appropriately, is also the symptom of advancement in spiritual life. Samak Saveshu Bhuteshu 
then Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param, one can actually enter into pure devotional service, as explained here. Undeviated devotional service, undeviated attention on Krishna. Then one will go above the modes of material nature and come to the Brahman platform and experience Brahman happiness, Krishna conscious happiness, relishing Krishna's name, form, quality, and pastimes within ourselves and remembering them and without seeing this world and everyone in it is in relationship to Krishna. And seeing even our enemies, our dear most friend, in their own way, helping us become Krishna conscious. Just like when Durvasa Muni threw a fiery demon at Ambrish Maharaj, Ambrish Maharaj didn't complain. Instead, he closed his eyes and thought about Krishna in great ecstasy. And finally, when Durvasa Muni, after being chased, by Krishna's Sudha San Chakra came to ask forgiveness from Ambrish Maharaj. Ambrish Maharaj was praying that the Sudha San Chakra would not harm Durvasa Muni. Instead, they became great friends. Now, because of our Vitpali concept of life, we think someone is our friend and some of our enemy because of how they're relating to us on the material platform. But the material platform is not the real platform. The real platform is the spiritual platform. Just like in a play, one may have the role of Frankenstein, or someone else may have the role of Dracula. Now, in the play, they may be, Dracula may be biting my neck, but I know it's just a play. And even if the good fairy comes and gives me a benediction, I don't really get any real benediction from the good fairy. It's just part of the play. Similarly, in this material world, someone may be apparently by my friend, someone apparently may be my enemy, but everyone is an instrument for Krishna. And in one sense, everyone is inspiring me to take shelter of Krishna, either by acting favorably in Krishna consciousness, or by acting unfavorably and forcing me to take shelter of Krishna. So this equality is obtained by, as it says here, by devotional service. That whether we know it or not, we have the opportunity to come to the perfection of life and we don't need to do so many things to do that. We don't have to become great scholars. We don't have to become great businessmen or women. We don't have to become great orators. We don't have to become expert at anything except to how to become expert to please Krishna and Krishna's representatives. All we, we don't have to change anything just by studying and hearing about Krishna. We just have to change our attitude from trying to become something we're not to trying to become something we actually are, the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. And if we accept that, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Yari Deka Tari Kaha, Krishna Upadesh, Amara Aga Guruhana Tari Desh. If we accept our position as the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna, and our meditation is simply whoever we meet we try to pray to Krishna in our heart for the intelligence of how we can serve this living entity to help them become Krishna conscious. As Sri Prabhupada was talking to Nara Narayan Prabhu one time, and Prabhupada pointed to his desk and said, do you see that bug? So Nara Narayan Prabhu, he looked on the desk, he couldn't see a bug, but he didn't want to get into an argument with Prabhupada over whether there was a bug there or not. So he said, yes, Prabhupada. Uh, I mean, I can't see it. I guess if you say it's there, it's there. So Prabhupada said, well, 
if we can make this bug Krishna conscious, then our whole movement is successful. So then Arnarayan Guru understood that actually Prabhupada is using this as an example that even if we make one bug Krishna conscious, our movement is successful. Another time Govinda Dasi, Prabhupada pointed a real bug to Govinda Dasi and said, do you see this bug? It looks like it's hungry. Give it some prasadam. Now, of course, our movement is not meant to liberate the bugs or to focus on bugs and make them Krishna conscious. But Prabhupada was using this as an example that that is our mission. Try to help others become Krishna conscious. At Haridas Thakur, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was lamenting about how the non-moving living entities can be delivered, the trees and other kinds of non-moving living entities, how they can be delivered, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very merciful and he was interested in delivering the whole universe to make it, help it become Krishna conscious. So Haridas Thakur said, my dear Lord, don't worry. Because if we loudly chant Hare Krishna, and even the, the non-living entities, such as the trees and the plants, they'll also become Krishna conscious. As a matter of fact, the echo from the trees is they're chanting Hare Krishna. So that's our mission, to, to learn to develop the expertise, the discrimination, the transcendental discrimination, and the transcendental expertise so whether we're distributing books on the street, as many devotees were doing in the marathon, or going out on Harinam and chanting the holy names, or distributing prasadam, or we're in our house with our children and wife or husband or relatives, then we should sit down morning and evening and chant Hare Krishna together. Offer some prasadam to the deities, here, Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. Somehow or another, whoever we meet, try to do something with them to help them become Krishna conscious. That takes a lot of transcendental discrimination and expertise, but that's, Krishna says, Tesham Satatam Yuktanam, Bhajantam Priti Purvakam, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, Jainamam Upyantite. Krishna will give us that booty, that intelligence, if that's what we desire. If that's what we're praying to Krishna for, then Krishna will be very happy to give it to us. And when we utilize it in Krishna's service to help others become Krishna conscious, then Krishna will reveal himself to us and we'll become ecstatic in love of God. And all our misgivings will go away. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Uh, Guru Maharaj, Mataji Valita Sundari have a question in Zoom. Okay. Mataji Valita, переведете? И зачитайте на русском, и потом переведите, чтобы все услышали. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you so much for the lecture. My question is, how do we um, uh, manifest our individuality in the spiritual world? Are we always in the service of Sri Krishna uh, or we are also serving the devotees there? Well, no one serves Krishna generally directly. We're always, <laughs> when we go to the spiritual world, we're always the servant of Krishna's service. We always have some leader. Even we become a servant, personal servant of Shimati Rarani, like the Mandris, still they have their leader. Lalita, Vishaka, other Sakis are still our leader. We're very tiny. We require a leader here in the material world and in the spiritual world too. There's always someone better than we are. Only when we become Krishna, if we became Krishna, we wouldn't require a leader to follow. But we're never going to become Krishna. We're never going to become Shrimati Rarani either. We're very tiny, so we always require a leader. 
And ultimately, when one becomes a pure devotee, he sees so many devotees. His, his he learns from so every he learns from everyone something. He only considers himself a dasya of the all the other dasis. And even Krishna, he considers himself a servant of his devotees. And Srimati Rarani, her guru is Lalita. She doesn't think I'm the best gopi. She thinks I'm simply the lowest gopi. And by the mercy of the other gopis, I'm able to serve Krishna nicely or try to serve Krishna nicely. So only in the material world are we trying to become a leader and the spiritual world, we're trying to become a servant, see others as our leaders, to develop, to serve Krishna better than we're doing. Otherwise, the spiritual world would be very boring if we were the leader. We didn't require a leader there. We wouldn't learn from anyone. That's the material world. We're trying to give up leaders, but we will have to take Maya as our leader. So we take our body as our supreme. And the spiritual world, we take Krishna as supreme, supreme and we take his devotees as the object of our service too. Anything else? Thank you, Hare Krishna, Grandara, Shema Bhagavad Gita, Kijai, Srila Prabhupada, Hari Hari Bol. Hari Hari Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hari Krishna Guru Maharaj.